And it's okay, I think it's all right to run 30 seconds ahead of schedule. Don't blame me if we do. But might as well take the time when we can. So uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce the moderator for this next panel, uh, Alicia Yamin, who is the Senior Fellow in the Global Health Rights Project here at the Petrie Flom Center. She is a world-renowned expert on the intersection of law, healthcare, human rights, global health. And we're just so excited and so lucky to have her as part of our team. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn, for that very kind and generous introduction. Um, and I'm delighted to be here to moderate this panel. Uh, I'm afraid that after the last couple of panels, which were disheartening, this panel is not going to be very much more heartening. Um, so, uh, but it is uh, an issue that is in the news constantly and one that has been at the forefront of the intersection of health and law this year and will continue to be next year. So we have four great speakers to talk about migration and health. Uh, and I'll introduce them in the order that they will speak. Uh, Wendy Parmet is the Matthews Distinguished University Professor of Law and Director of the Center for Health Policy and Law at Northeastern University School of Law and Professor of Public Policy and Urban Affairs at Northeastern University School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs. She's a leading expert on health, disability, and public health law. Uh, she directs Northeastern's joint JDMPH program. She's incredibly, uh, has a distinguished list of publications including in this field um, on migration and health. Um, Tiffany Joseph is an associate professor of sociology and international affairs at Northeastern University. She is an assistant professor of sociology, oh, she was an assistant professor of sociology at Stony Brook from 2013 to 2018. And her research explores the micro-level consequences of public policy on individuals, Immigrants' Health and Healthcare Access, Comparative Frameworks of Race and Migration in the Americas, and the Experiences of Faculty of Color and Women in Academia. Um, then we're going to hear from Sabrina Ardalan, who's an Assistant Clinical Professor of Law at Harvard Law School and Assistant Director of the Harvard Immigration and Refugee Clinic. At the clinic, she supervises and trains law students working on applications for asylum and other humanitarian protections, as well as appellate litigation and policy advocacy. She's authored amicus briefs submitted to the Board of Immigration Appeals, as well as to federal district courts, circuit courts of appeal, and the US Supreme Court. Um, and last but not least, we're going to hear from Francis Chen, whose research focuses on the ways in which law and public policy um, who, sorry, who is executive director of the Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior at MGH and an instructor in psychology at Harvard Medical School, an associate professor of law and a McKnight Land Grant professor at the University of Minnesota, where he directs the Shen Neurolaw Lab. And he also serves as executive director of education and outreach activities for the MacArthur Foundation Research Network on Law and Neuroscience, and serves on the board of scientific advisors for the National Courts and Science Institute. He is, uh, he's also been a senior fellow in the Project on Law and Applied Neuroscience, um, which is a collaboration with the Petrie Flom Center. Francis's research focuses on the ways in which law and public policy can be improved through integration of brain science, and he has also published very widely. So we're looking forward to hearing from each of them, and I'll let them go in that order. Um, got it. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I'll try to not make this too depressing. I'm not sure. Um, so since um, the Trump administration has taken off, took office in January 2017, it has undertaken a wide range of initiatives that are designed to reduce both legal and unauthorized immigration. And taken together, these initiatives um, have formed what immigration advocates often call the invisible wall. And they have succeeded in dramatically reducing immigration to the United States. They've also made life far more precarious for non-citizens and members of non-citizens' families who live in the United States. 
In my talk, I want to just talk about a few what I call the health-focused policies. I should be clear, I think all of these policies have an impact on health, and uh, my co-panelists will talk about some of that. But I want to talk about policies that sort of explicitly zero in on health. And I want to talk about their impact for our healthcare system, both concretely and symbolically. And I will talk about a, a set of rules known as the public charge rules, emphasis on the plural, the president's health insurance mandate, and the medical deferred action uh, policies. And I could talk about many others, but I only have 15 minutes. Before doing so, I think it's worth recalling that immigration laws adverse effect on our healthcare system did not start in 2017, although my talk just started talking about 2017. In fact, I have had the privilege of speaking at this conference in years past, even before the Trump administration, talking about the intersection between immigration law and health law. And even before the Trump administration, a series of federal and state laws made it very difficult for many non-citizens, including many who were lawfully present, to access health insurance. And it's for this reason that non-citizens of pretty much every immigration status are far more likely than citizens to be um, uninsured than citizens. And this is across status, and this predates the Trump administration. Um, and to some extent, after the ACA came into play, at least in the expansion states, the uninsurance problem in the US is significantly a problem of non to not uh, focused on non-citizens. Nevertheless, there's no doubt that the Trump administration has um, exacerbated the problem. And one large vehicle for doing so is through the public charge rule. Now, this is an old provision in the Immigration and Naturalization Act. It goes back to the 1880s. Um, and it bars admission or adjustment of status to non-citizens who, in the opinion of the consular offices at any time of the application, is likely at any time to become a public charge. Okay, That's the provision. And I'm not going to go through all the details. Not all classes of immigrants are subject to this. Refugees and asylees and others subject to humanitarian statuses are not. But the provision is there. It's had a pretty um, ignoble history. Um, this was the provision that was used to bar many of the refugees from the Holocaust back in the 30s. The provision, though, has long been held not to apply, and this is the point, critical point for present purposes, to non-cash benefits. So the fact that somebody received public health insurance did not make you a public charge. Um, and a 1999 guidance um, from ISIS predecessor INS said as much. As soon as the Trump administration took office, they began looking for ways to change that. Um, and finally, after a series of leaks and changes, and I won't go through the whole history because we'll run out of time, in August, last August, the administration issued final regulations from the Department of Homeland Security that would dramatically change the definition of public charge. And the new definition um, defines, and this is sort of what is a public charge? A public charge under the new definition is somebody who at any time in their future, okay, if, imagine if they live to be 120, any time in their future, would receive one or more public benefits in a specified list for 12 out of 36 months. And if you receive two benefits for one month, that counts as two, as two months, OK? And the benefits include now Medicaid, but not emergency Medicaid, but what we typically think of as Medicaid, SNAP, food stamps, and federal housing benefits. And I should say Medicaid does not count for kids for this provision, they exempt kids. 
In addition, and remember, this is a forward-looking kind of process, right? Will anybody, and you can imagine, I, I was kidding a moment ago about living to be 120. Many of us, if we are old enough, will, lucky enough to live that long, will at some point need some of these benefits, right? Um, but in determining whether an individual is likely to become a public charge in the future, the regulations require officials to consider a whole bunch of factors and treat past receipt of any of those benefits from 12 out of 36 months as a heavily weighted negative factor. Also, if one has a serious medical condition without private health insurance or the resources to pay for their care on their own, that's a heavily weighted negative factor. And conversely, Having private health insurance, which does not include ACA subsidized insurance, is a heavily weighted positive factor. So a lot of folks have talked about the implications for health care. Um, they are many. The rule almost certainly will increase the number of people <coughs> foregoing benefits, right? Because they'd be afraid this is a heavily weighted negative factor. By the way, we, almost everybody who has looked at this anticipates that many people who are not actually subject to the rule are going to forego benefits because the immigrant community is so afraid. And many people are expected to forego benefits for their citizen children who are actually not covered by the rule. Um, the rule may affect the health care workforce because we rely very heavily on low-wage immigrants, particularly for home health aides and nursing home workers, for example. Um, the rule will have enormous disruptive impacts to the administration of state health care programs. Um, states under the ACA and the expansion states have single forms, single shopping. You enroll in one form, and the state puts you. Do you get ACA? Do you get Medicaid? You can't do that now, because enrolling in Medicaid is a negative factor. Right? So states may now have to disaggregate their forms and keep track of things differently. Massachusetts may need to, and the state has said this, get rid of its health insurance mandate. Because how do you mandate that people get benefits if they are going to suffer immigration penalties for having the insurance the state requires? Um, and the rule will probably discourage timely diagnosis of medical conditions because having a serious medical condition is a negative factor. Uh, the rule may, and the Department of Homeland S S uh, Security has said this, will lead to increases in vaccine preventable diseases. The administration concedes this. It will likely reduce funding for mental health and substance use disorders while we are in the midst of an opioid epidemic. And um, it will also decrease right, access to SNAP and housing benefits, which are themselves insignificant um, forces for redressing social determinants. Well, probably not surprising, right after the rule was promulgated, um, it was supposed to take effect on October 15th, 22 states and local governments and NGOs filed suit. There were nine cases filed in five different federal district courts. And within four or five days of October 15th, when the rule was supposed to take effect, Five federal district courts issued injunctions. Uh, three of those were nationwide injunctions. The, all of the district courts found that um, DHS had departed from its lo the, the INA's longstanding statutory interpretation, that the, that the DHS was acting arbitrarily and capriciously in large measure for not considering the health care costs problems and the public health implications of the bill. Two courts also found that the act was likely to violate the rehabilitation, excuse me, that the rule was likely to violate the Rehabilitation Act. And I want to notice standing, which was very contested. All of the courts found that the health care consequences gave the plaintiff standing. Well, that's where I thought we were until I woke up at 6 AM. And I discovered that last night, while well, after I turned off my computer, the Ninth Circuit stayed uh, two of the injunctions um, in a three to uh, split decision from a panel in the Ninth Circuit found that the um, 
rule, DHS is likely to succeed on the merits under the Chevron doctrine. The court said Congress simply has not <coughs> spoken to how public charge should be defined. They found that the rule was in accord with federal immigration policy and that DHS was not arbitrary or capricious because DHS had adequately looked at direct costs and the indirect costs, including the public health consequences, were simply not, need not be considered because they were indirect. Now I should say, because there are nationwide injunctions from other courts, the rule remains at least, I mean, since I last looked at my, since 9 a.m., it remains in place. Um, but that's where we are with public charge. Litigation is pending also in the Second Circuit, the Third Circuit, and, uh, excuse me, the Fourth Circuit, and the Seventh Circuit. Meanwhile, the DHS rules are not the only rules. Um, the administration is dealing with the public charge rule that sort of coming at it, 360. Um, the Department of State promulgated its own public charge rules to align its rules with DHS's. These would apply only when people seek to migrate from account to get a visa overseas at the a consular's office. However, many people who are here now need to go overseas to change their status to get their green card. So people who are living in the country can be affected by the DOS rules. Um, the final rule was supposed to take effect October 15th, but uh, DOS has postponed it until December. And perhaps particularly troublesome, the Department of Justice has published in the Federal Register its intent to promulgate deportability rules. I don't want to go through because of time, but deportation on public charge grounds is possible in a very limited set of circumstances right now. Um, and so it's very, very rare. These rules, we don't know what they're going to do. They have not yet published even proposed rules, but there is tremendous fear that they will try to align deportation with the domestic DHS rules and maybe push at the statute. And of course, if using public benefits could lead to deportation, everything I said about the chill will now be amplified to an extraordinary degree. Meanwhile, Perhaps ironically, I'm not quite sure, um, on October 4th, just before the public charge DHS rule was set to take place, a week before the district courts enjoined it, the president issued a public health insurance, a, excuse me, not public, a health insurance proclamation which would deny entry to immigrants, again, not including refugees and asylees, who do not have approved health insurance or the financial resources to pay for reasonably foreseeable medical expense. This was meant to be in addition to the public charge rule. And the proclamation um, announced that approved health insurance included short-term plans, employer-sponsored plans, catastrophic plans, Medicare, TRICARE, not includes, does not include Medicaid, um, or, ACA subsidized plans. In other words, it includes unregulated but not regulated plans, right? Medicare is pretty much not available to this population. Employer-sponsored plan is almost never available to somebody who's first getting a visa until they actually come and begin employment. So this is really forcing immigrants to buy unregulated, um, not great insurance. Uh, not surprising, the federal district court in Oregon issued a TRO. And for administrative law buffs here, on November 26, the court issued a preliminary injunction relying on the non-delegation doctrine and the Supreme Court's decision last spring in the Gundy case. And so here we have, I think, I have to say, conservative jurisprudence come in like this. Because on the one hand, they want plenary and sort of unfettered discretion over immigration, and on the other hand, a sort of re, you know, repowering of the non-delegation and 
limiting the administrative <coughs> state. And the problem, of course, is that DHS is part of the administrative state, so is DOS. So I'm not sure where this reconciles. Meanwhile, this summer, um, in August, the uh, DHS notified non-citizens seeking renewal of medical deferred action. These are very sick, often critically sick children and adults that their requests to stay in the country um, were denied and that they had 33 days to leave. As many of you may have known, may know, um, there was a lot of political pushback to this. And in response to the political backlash, UC USCIS announced it would resume consideration of applications, although it said that the future of the program remains uncertain. Litigation was filed, but it was stayed because we don't know what's going to happen now. Um, so what, where are we and what lies ahead? And I'm sure we'll talk more in the Q&A. Obviously, there are a lot of cases and uh, going before the courts of appeals. And to some extent, I think no doubt we're going to, some of this is going to end up in the Supreme Court. And as I said, it's an interesting question about Chevron non-delegation doctrine and, you know, sort of which side of this all are you on. Um, it, to, to some extent, it doesn't matter what happens in the case. The chill is here and the chill continues. People are scared. People are disenrolling. Uninsurance rates are going up now for the first time since the ACA, okay? Uncompensated care costs then are going to go up, right? Families are not following the litigation as closely as I am. They just know it's dangerous times. I want to end, though, with Ken Cuccinelli's statement that's got a lot of press um, the day the public charge rule was announced, right? He said, give me your tired, your poor, who can stand on their own feet and will not become a public charge. This was widely taken, right, to show his antipathy to immigration. And it certainly does that, although then he said the um, Statue of Liberty was meant to be for U Europeans only. So we can get into that conversation. But I want to su suggest that that's his statement, Cuccinelli's statement, and the image and, and meaning of healthcare needs that we see in the medical deferred action, the proclamation, and the public charge rules reflect Cuccinelli's view and that they are antithetical to the idea that we have a health care system and that we have public health. Because underlying and what ties together all of these different provisions, besides their antipathy to immigration, is the idea that if somebody's sick, if somebody's poor, we don't want you. We don't want you if you're sick, right? It's your own problem. Don't come into this country if you're sick. Leave, be deported if you are. And so the very idea that we have a healthcare system and the very idea so intrinsic to public health, right, that our health is so, at least in large measure, socially determined, and that things like communicable diseases are public bads, um, that the Trump administration's immigration policy is not just about immigration. It's really about the public and public health. So thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. So what I will be doing is talking a little bit about a research project that I've been working on the last seven years, trying to understand how shifts in immigration, po I'm sorry, in health policy have affected immigrants' healthcare access here in the Boston area. So I'm going to be making this a little bit more local, but talking about how this ties to, so I guess that doesn't work, how this ties to um, what's been happening at the federal level in terms of health reform, but also what's been happening in the state of Massachusetts. And so the primary question that I'll be addressing in today's talk is this issue of how does shifting public policy affect immigrants' health care access here in the Boston area? And so one of the things that I found in my research over the last seven years that issues of conflicting policies at, let's say, what's happening in Massachusetts with the state level reform and distinctions between that 
that and the Affordable Care Act have created a lot of confusion about immigrants' eligibility in terms of their documentation status. And in addition to that, there has also been increased law in immigration enforcement um, within Massachusetts, uh, within the city of Boston, the Boston <coughs> metropolitan area. That has generated a lot of fear around using services, even when people are eligible for applying for coverage here. And so my argument has been, in terms of the work that I've been doing, is that immigrants' health care access has actually gotten worse over time uh, as these different reforms have been in place, starting with the Massachusetts reform and the Affordable Care Act, and then in terms of thinking about uh, my colleagues talk about public charge and the Trump immigration policies. These things have just made things worse over time for this segment of the population. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much background, um, just in the interest of time, but I will quickly say that in terms of thinking about this notion of citizenship and thinking about the role of immigration and policy, um, I'm referring to, uh, when I refer to the term citizen, I'm thinking more in terms of people who are legally recognized as citizens and are entitled to certain benefits that non-members or non-citizens are excluded from. Um, and in terms of thinking about the numbers around immigration, um, there's an estimated 41 million immigrants in the United States that have a range of statuses. Of that number, about 11 million are undocumented, but that other 30 million has a wide range of statuses, some including naturalized citizens, green card holders, and visa holders. And so this is important to think about in terms of when we talk about immigration, who are we talking about, it's particularly with regard to eligibility and how within the law, documentation status shapes eligibility under particular policies. Um, there's been a lot of focus within immigration scholarship on the experiences of undocumented immigrants and their vulnerability. But increasingly, uh, we're seeing more and more attention being given to the experience of immigrants that are uh, green card holders, for instance, individuals with temporary protected status. So that's come up in the news in the last couple of years as a program that's been, um, that's uh, now at risk of being ended for certain populations. Um, and what's important to note, even though this doesn't often come through in the media, is that all immigrants, until they are citizens, are deportable by the US government. So this means you can be a tax-paying green card holder who's been here for 20 years, and you could be deported by the US government. So that similar level of deportability exists for a wide range of immigrants, not just the undocumented. And this is important when we're talking about using health services and thinking about the current socio-political climate. Of course, when we talk about this issue, we have to think about the intersection of various areas of policy in the United States. Uh, the first being immigration policy, um, and the most important thing I'll mention here is the 1996 Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, which was really important in terms of criminalizing the use of fraudulent documents, uh, the notion of public charge as a deportable offense, or it was something that was given more attention under the 1996 reform. Um, and there has been no comprehensive reform since 1996. And so this means that whatever status people are in, they're kind of stuck in it. There is really no way to adjust their status. And we have to think about how this intersects with welfare policy, because also in 1996, the Personal Resp Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act was also passed at the same time. And this was really important because it implemented a five-year residency bar for green card holders or legal permanent residents to receive benefits. So this means that even if you have a green card and you're paying your taxes, if you haven't had that status for five years, you're ineligible for any sort of public benefit benefits under the Affordable Care Act or any other sort of public benefits. Um, and this also made other immigrants and other statuses, uh, undocumented immigrants, visa holders, as well ineligible for those benefits as well. And so these 1996 reforms have carried over into health policy when we think about the 2010 Affordable Care Act, which is one of the reasons uh, that primarily um, until you reach this five-year bar as a green card holder or you're a naturalized citizen, have temporary protected status or a refugee or asylee, you are ineligible for provisions of the ACA or the Affordable Care Act. 
Um, and so just to talk a little bit briefly about the data and methods for this project, uh, basically essentially what I've done over the years since I started this study in 2012 when the Massachusetts health reform was in place, uh, I've been following policy shifts um, in terms of health policy and trying to understand how documentation status has shaped access or eligibility under both of these reforms. Um, and then I've also on the ground been doing interviews with relevant stakeholder groups here in the Boston area. Uh, starting with different immigrant populations, I decided to focus primarily on Brazilian, Dominican, and Salvadoran immigrants, as those are three of the largest immigrant groups here in the Boston area. They're all from different parts of Latin America. Uh, they have a range of different documentation statuses. And they're also racialized differently in terms of phenotype. And as a sociologist of race and immigration, I wanted to understand how all those factors together were shaping their experiences navigating the healthcare system here. I also interviewed a sample of healthcare providers uh, in terms of physicians, medical interpreters, caseworkers from a multi hospital network here in the Boston area that I will refer to as the Boston Health Coalition to find out from their perspective as providers how these policies have shaped their ability to provide care to their uh, immigrant patients. And then I also interviewed immigrant and health advocacy organization employees to understand the broader socio political climate in the Boston area and what else is happening here locally that might be shaping immigrants' access to healthcare as well. And so here is just uh, a table with the different people that I've interviewed over the course of the project. And as you can see, I don't think the, the laser works on this. But uh, when I started the study in 2012, that was under the original Massachusetts health reform. Um, and then um, when the Affordable Care Act get, got implemented, I returned in 2015 to do a set of interviews as well to see how the shift from the health of the Massachusetts reform to Obamacare reconfigured the health care system. And then after the 2016 election happened, I thought it might be important to try to understand what's happening now. And so I did another set of interviews um, earlier this year. And I will say that the immigrant um, group is a lot smaller, was a lot smaller this time because recruitment was a lot more difficult because of the current socio-political climate. I'll also briefly say too that for the study, um, in terms of concerns from the uh, from IRB or the uh, the IRB board at my institution, um, I was not allowed to re-interview uh, immigrant respondents, so all of those responders knew out of concerns for their vulnerability. But I was able to re-interview at least 10 of the providers and employees from the different immigrant and health advocacy organizations over time. So that really allowed me to be able to get a sense of these shifts uh, as they were happening on the ground from these relevant perspectives. Just quickly here, information about the uh, immigrant sample, uh, the health care providers, uh, the immigrant health advocacy organization employees. I can go back to these during the Q&A. Um, and so I'll go ahead and get into uh, my findings. So with regard to the first issue around conflicting policies, I just want to draw your attention to this chart here, uh, which is actually a part of a paper that I published a few years ago um, comparing uh, how documentation status shapes uh, healthcare eligibility under the Massachusetts reform, um, the original reform, Chapter 58, then after the ACA was implemented in Massachusetts, and the last column accounts for the ACA in compliance states. So the most important thing to remember about this chart is notice how in Massachusetts, before and after ACA implementation, regardless of what your status is, depending on your income level, you have access or eligibility to apply for some sort of coverage in the state starting at undocumented, going all the way down to US born citizens. Under the ACA, you'll notice there is not as much flexibility. And again, this is tied to the federal uh, 1996 reforms, which limit eligibility. And so this confusion between what people are eligible for in terms of if we're looking at state level, the Massachusetts reform, compared to Obamacare, on the ground, this sometimes created a lot of confusion among healthcare navigators, among immigrants themselves in terms of figuring out, am I actually eligible for anything um, in the context of Massachusetts? And so one of the immigrants, a Salvadoran immigrant that I interviewed in 2015, talked about how this played out for him. And he says, look, in theory, it is easy to get insurance, but in practice, not so much. 
And he talks about how he applied multiple times for coverage and he never got any notification back from the Mass Health Connector. And then when he finally received notification, he was told that he wasn't eligible. And then he talks about how when he would go to the healthcare offices, but there are often ads that would advertise, yes, you can apply for coverage that say you won't pay anything, but then you get a huge medical bill. So this conflict between what people are eligible for in terms of what's available at the state level in Massachusetts, but how that intersects with Obamacare implementation created a lot of confusion on the ground regarding eligibility. The other big issue that came up a lot over the course of the study, even when I started in 2012 and has only intensified since then, is the increasing role of enforcement and how that leads to a fear of using health services. So before 2017, before uh, the election of uh, President Trump, um, a social worker that I interviewed with the, from the Boston Health Coalition says, we face issues with immigrant patients who were facing deportation because they were coming to the clinic and they were pulled over. There was a period of time when the new reform came about, and in this particular case, this person is referring to the Secure Communities Act, uh, which uh, actually Massachusetts was a pilot state for, and this was a program uh, through the federal government that did information sharing between local law enforcement and the federal government in terms of Department of Homeland Security. And she says that uh, when this was put in place, the police were going and stopping people and doing raids and stuff. So a lot of our patients got caught. And she talks about this specific example of a patient that was coming to the clinic and just said, I'm not going to come today because I saw a police car on my way and I'm turning around and I'm going home. And so again, this was in 2012, 2013, my first set of interviews. Um, also in pre-2017, uh, pre when I came back in 2015, uh, when I was doing these interviews, it actually coincided with the presidential nomination process. And when it looked like Donald Trump was going to be the nominee, people started talking about him in interviews. And so one uh, person that I interviewed from a health advocacy organization talked about how with Islamophobia, anti-immigrant sentiment, which is way too prevalent, I think people get even more afraid and it really does create a culture of fear in some immigrant communities. People really are afraid and this kind of rhetoric that we hear really does drive people away. And people, they stay in the shadows, they don't want to apply for coverage, I mean e including even if they have legal statuses. So here, even before the election in 2017, just because the climate was starting to shift then nationally, uh, healthcare advocates and healthcare providers were already talking about seeing people disenroll from services then in 2016. And just to bring this uh, to the present in terms of my most recent set of interviews uh, from an immigrant advocacy organization employee, he makes this comparison between the pre and post election period. And he says, before the Trump administration, you know, you would go into the health center and health centers full of people seeking services, whether it's related to a medical need or was just coming to the health center to be connected and referred out to different services. When things started to unfold early in the presidency, the health center was empty. Nobody was coming. And he goes on to say that we need to really think about the role of public health in this process in terms of if people are not going for needed vaccinations, relevant health screenings, that this isn't an issue that only affects us. And so just to get ready to conclude, uh, what I found in my research over time is that essentially things have gotten worse. Uh, ironically, as these policies got passed and they were supposed to increase access to health coverage and health care for most individuals, it actually had the opposite impact impact for immigrants. So thank, for, thank you for your time and I look forward to taking your questions. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about my experiences working at the Harvard Immigration and Refugee Clinical Program uh, with uh, immigrants as they're going through the deportation process and the effect that that process has on their health care. Um, some of the strategies and experiences we've had in collaborating with medical and mental health professionals uh, going th as our clients go through that process, um, both as expert witnesses and also in terms of um, an interdisciplinary model that we have in our clinic. So to piggyback on what um, the previous speakers uh, have been mentioning, um, you know, as people go through the deportation process, they have many fears about accessing healthcare. Um, and in our clinic, 
um, until about six years ago, uh, as lawyers, we struggled with this because our clients often suffer from extraordinary amounts of trauma um, and are forced to retell their stories as they prepare for their dates in immigration court, as they prepare to explain their story to asylum officers. And so what, what we saw working with clients was dramatic decompensation as people were opening up and revisiting past harms that they hadn't had to talk about, that their only coping mechanism for having survived was to push as much out of their memory as humanly possible. And um, because the immigration process, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, forced them to open up about it, um, they decompensated and often ended up in the ER, in inpatient psych units, and as lawyers, we didn't have a framework for dealing with that. And it undermined our ability to represent them effectively in immigration court because we couldn't meet with them, we couldn't prepare them for trial. And so what we've developed in the clinic is an interdisciplinary model where we have an in-house social worker and social work interns who are able to work with us through the process, not only to make our method of working with clients more trauma sensitive and um, in order to support them as they go through that process, but also from the outset to connect them to the medical and mental health care that they need to provide them with preventative and supportive services um, that they are eligible for but might have been too afraid to navigate finding or might not have known about even within their communities, though they might have lived very close to a community health center, um, you know, are, through that interdisciplinary model, we are able to connect them to services that, is, that have really helped. So since we've had this model in place, we haven't luckily had any clients who have, um, you know, ended up in, in the ER or in these really precarious um, circumstances that we previously had had because from the get-go at our first intake meeting we're able to connect them to, to these services um, and you know we're in a very privileged space that we're, we're able to do that um, so what I wanted to do today was just give you a little bit of background on what um, the removal defense system looks like, what, what is the asylum process, why does it re-traumatize re people, um, who's going through that process right now, and why is um, this intersection of immigration and mental health and medical professionals so important as we go through that process. Um, so in terms of... Um, the current asylum system, uh, you know, I think folks have seen in the news and as that first graphic that our first speaker um, put up, I think showed so, so beautifully, there is in fact an invisible wall and I think, you know, an attempt at building a real wall, but anyways, um, trying to prevent people from even coming to the U.S. to seeking, to seek the protection that they so desperately need, right? Um, people often say, you know, I think that the new theory of life is why can't people, you know, seek asylum in Mexico? Why can't they seek asylum in Guatemala? Um, and, and the fact of the matter is that people only flee from their countries because many of the people that we deal with only flee because of the fear that they have um, for their lives. They wouldn't go through this really arduous journey if they had any other option. And there's no other country um, between where they fled from and their route to coming here where they feel safe, right? So they, they need to be here to be safe. Um, and increasing numbers of people are coming to the US. So when I first started working in the clinic here 11 years ago, um, there are about 40 to 50 people, 40 to 50,000 people seeking asylum in the US every year. Um, Last year, there were over 200,000 people who um, came to the US to seek asylum. And, and right now, according to UNHCR's calculations, there are about 700,000 pending asylum claims in the US. Um, so the current asylum system is really overloaded and backlogged. And what does that mean for people's mental health and medical health as they're going through this process? It has really severe implications. So, um, for example, I was in court this morning with a team of students representing um, a man who was resettled here as a refugee many years ago, um, and the U.S. government was trying to deport him um, because of certain criminal convictions that he had had, and he has been in detention for over six months. Um, during that time, he has been unable to access the medical or mental health care that he so desperately needs, um, and, you know, even though we've been working with our social worker to try to access for him the care that he needs within the detention facility, they just don't have the services that he, that he needs um, in order to in order to even 
live his daily life. Um, and, you know, so, so whether it's waiting in detention for your day in court, or whether it's, as a client um, who had a hearing last week, whether it's waiting over six years, not detained, but for your day in court. So the client who is hearing um, we had last week, he arrived in 2013 and finally had the start of his merits hearing the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. But of course, the government offices closed early the day before Thanksgiving, so we have to come back next year to finish it. Um, so you know, th this dramatic waiting period can really um, understandably affect people's mental health. Um, and physical health as, as they're um, waiting in limbo. And whether or not people have work authorization as they're waiting in limbo is, is a whole nother um, question. Many, many do not. Um, and um, you know, I think some other impacts on medical and mental health care as people go through this process um, that are systematic are the lack of representation um, for folks as they go through um, the deportation process. So there is a right to representation at your own expense in immigration proceedings. What does that mean? It means that the majority of people who are in removal proceedings, who the government is trying to deport, do not have access to counsel because they cannot afford a lawyer. Here in Boston, we're lucky. We have a very robust um, legal services community, clinics. Um, people have access to lawyers more often than not. But in many parts of the country, that is not the case. Um, and the outcomes are wi uh, very wildly depending on whether or not people have representation. So folks with representation who are not detained, the grant rates can be as high as 80%. Folks who are detained and do not have representation, the grant rates can be as low as 3 or 4%. Um, so all of these different factors uh, you know, take a serious toll on people's um, mental health as they're going through the process. And that's just the asylum process and system. I want to take a minute to look at what it takes to establish eligibility for asylum or protection under the torture convention here in the US and, and talk a little bit about why just trying to establish eligibility for protection can be so re-traumatizing and um, what you know, additional toll in addition to these systemic issues that can take on people's medical and mental health. So in order to show eligibility for asylum in the US, you have to show that you have a well-founded fear of persecution on account of one of five grounds, your race, your religion, your nationality, your membership in a particular social group, or your political opinion. And uh, in order to establish eligibility, um, one method of doing so is to show that you have suffered past persecution. You don't have to have suffered past persecution, but if somebody who's applying for asylum can show that they've established past persecution, that shifts the burden to the government. The government then has to explain why it's reasonable for the person to return to their home country, why circumstances have changed for them, or why they might be able to move somewhere else in the country and be safe. And so as advocates, our job is to try to, as much as possible, elicit this past harm and present it to the adjudicator in order to shift the burden and put it on the government to, to try to rebut it. Um, practically speaking, what does that mean? It means in the clinic, meeting with clients for hundreds of hours over the course of a semester to elicit every terrible thing that's ever happened to them in their entire lives and to try to fit it with this refugee definition um, that requires linking the harm suffered or feared to one of these five grounds. And in asylum cases, um, as in torture convention cases, the applicant's testimony is often the only proof people have. Um, people don't tend to flee their home countries with, with much. Um, and persecutors don't often tend to write notes, right, that say why they're targeting a person. And so developing the person's story and writing that story for the adjudicator, we hope can you know, take some of the burden off of the client as they're testifying because the adjudicators presumably, hopefully, read their story. And so that can give them some context. Otherwise, you know, if, if people are working with attorneys who have really big caseloads, sometimes the person's statement is just a handful of paragraphs. And then it's really their testimony in court or in front of the asylum office that dictates outcomes. Um, in order to seek protection under the torture convention, similarly, um, it requires people to open up about torture that they've suffered in the past. So um, the torture convention requires 
that somebody show that it's more likely than not that they would suffer torture if they were returned to a country. Past torture can be relevant to establishing whether or not somebody might fear future torture. So for example, in the case this morning, um, the refugee who um, we were representing had suffered over a year of torture in a government facility as a 10-year-old child. He hadn't talked about that to anybody since he'd been resettled here as a refugee over a decade ago. But because he was facing deportation, we had to talk to him in excruciating detail about what that year and a half of his life was like and force him to relive all of those memories in order to present that case in court, um, in order to, to try to prove to the judge and that he would, in fact, suffer torture in the future. And, and how, does one, how does one show that anything is more likely than not right, in, in the future? So you know, the, the best that we can do as advocates is, is try to present this evidence from the client's own words and from the words of medical and mental health professionals who we draw in to this process. So um, we often work very closely with medical and mental health professionals who serve as experts um, as we go through this process. In, in the case today, for example, um, we had a doctor who went to the detention facility and conducted an evaluation of our client. He was able to document the scars that our client had um, suffered and, and still had from the torture he'd endured. Uh, he was able to document the lasting effects of post-traumatic stress disorder that the, that the client was suffering from. And he was able to write an expert affidavit um, so that when we went to court today and, and the judge asked us, you know, what evidence do we have that it's more likely than not that he would be tortured in the future, we could point, the student in his closing argument could point not only to the client's own words, but also to um, this expert affidavit, as well as country condition evidence and a country condition expert. And the reason this collaboration is so important is even though an applicant's testimony alone should be enough under US immigration law, it often isn't enough. So adjudicators can demand corroboration where it's reasonably available. What's reasonably available? This is up to interpretation, um, but often things like medical records, uh, you know, any, any interaction anybody's had with, with a doctor or medical or mental health professional, that's considered relevant. Um, and it's often our clients haven't had the opportunity to have ongoing treatment or care, and so these experts can come in and, and help fill that um, gap in corroborating uh, corroboration. In addition to documenting scars um, and documenting um, post-traumatic stress disorder in our clients, Medical and mental health professionals are often very critical in, in helping adjudicators to understand why our clients might have difficulty telling their stories in a consistent and coherent fashion. So um, often our clients have suffered things like traumatic brain injuries um, or the trauma that they've suffered um, might have created a situation where they have tried very hard not to recall details and so as they recall them, they come back piecemeal, and they're unable to explain their stories in, in what a U.S. adjudicator might expect, in a, in a manner a U.S. adjudicator might expect, right? Um, as lawyers, we try to present things in a chronological fashion, linearly, um, with extraordinary detail. That's not often how our clients tell, our, tell their stories, and so experts can help explain why that's the case. Another um, point at which medical and mental health professionals um, come into play in, in our cases is under a U.S. asylum law, people are required to apply for asylum within their first year here in the U.S. Um, and so, but often people aren't able to come forward within their first year here in the U.S. And the only way of excusing a delay in coming forward is by showing an extraordinary circumstance. What counts as an extraordinary circumstance? Two things. Um, it could be a medical or a mental health disorder or um, a disability that prevented someone from coming forward. And so again, medical and mental health experts are really critical to proving that somebody suffered from PTSD such that they weren't able to come forward in the time required. So I just want to conclude quickly about, um, in addition to working together with uh, medical and mental health professionals in this removal defense system as experts, it's also really important um, as lawyers that we work together with them in terms of um, creating connections to ongoing treatment and care. So to end on a slightly more positive note, in our case this morning, 
our client was granted protection under the torture convention, and um, the judge in you know, giving him um, this grant admonished him that he needed, once he was released from detention, to connect to the treatment he desperately needed. The reason he had even been put into removal proceedings um, had been because of you know, turning to things like alcohol and you know, various other substances to manage things like his post-traumatic stress disorder. He hadn't gotten the medical and mental health care that he needed. Um, and so our hope is that we can, you know, with the help of our social worker, connect him to some of those longer-term services once he's released from detention so that he can live and thrive here. Um, thank you. Well, good afternoon. Thank you uh, for being here and um, to uh, Carmel, Caitlin, Christy, and, and Glenn for another great uh, Patriot Flown program. Uh, my name is Francis Shen, and I direct uh, another center um, called the Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior. We're based at Mass General Hospital, and we have a really neat um, connection with the Petrie Flom Center, uh, this project on law and applied neuroscience. Uh, it's a wonderful program, and I'll talk a little bit about it in the work that we're doing in this uh, area. Uh, I'll just mention that the Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior, um, it's the only other slide I'll have, um, clbb.org, if you're interested in more, is really, we, we hope, at the vanguard of this new intersection, uh, almost brand new, of neuroscience and law. And our goal in general, and in immigration justice specifically, is to make neuroscience actionable uh, for the legal community, and that's to produce better outcomes. Uh, our ideas, the brain and the law, are both very complex um, but our mission is simple, to take that complexity and make it useful for judges, attorneys, caseworkers, enforcement agents, and many others in the system. Um, the big idea is that better uh, outcomes aligned with justice will result from better decisions aligned with science. Of course, it's not that easy, and I, I do want to thank my colleagues uh, at the center, co-founders and co-directors Bruce Price and Judy Edersheim, uh, and our colleagues here, Judge Nancy Gertner, and then Dr. Robert Kintriff, uh, and also thanks to medical student uh, Aldous Patrix, who helped with some of this work you'll see here today. Uh, the background for our work in immigration really emerges out of three other areas that we've been very active in, juvenile justice, criminal sentencing, and aging brains and decision making. And for each of those programs, and again, thanks to, to Petrie Flom, we've partnered around programs. And in each of those areas, I could tell you success stories about the way that law, both doctrine and practice, have perhaps slowly, but changed, we think, in positive ways based on appropriate introduction and engagement with new neuroscience. And so today I'm going to raise questions uh, and tell you about the work we've done the last year, again, in combination with Petrie Flom, about our newest area of work, immigration justice. And the question there is whether, given the uh, context you've just heard, neuroscience has any role to play. And I want to thank uh, Sabi uh, and the uh, clinic that she runs, the Harvard Immigration Refugee Clinical Program, for partnering with us. Because looking back on this past year, it was just in March of this year, about nine months ago, that we planted the seed for this work in basically this very corridor. We ran a program called Trauma at the Border. It brought together Dr. Charles Nelson, uh, expert on developmental neuroscience and trauma, along with um, the clinic uh, represented by Cindy Zapata. And we opened up what I said then and would say now was uh, the beginning of a, of a difficult dialogue. Uh, part of the difficulty are all of the challenges you've just heard. I mean, things are clearly tough. Another part of the difficulty is that neuroscience, and I'll say this now and at the end, does not have any magic solution. This was not a conversation about taking some new neurotech down to the border, producing scans, bringing it to a judge, and curing everything. You know, as I said to your class, there are just so many limitations right now with neuroscience. Uh, it's challenging to know what's here. But um, we've persisted a lot this year, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that and then look ahead to what we have upcoming. Uh, and I've organized my comments uh, around uh, just three questions. No slides, but three questions. The first is an empirical question. Are there any brain stories to tell in this space? Now, on this question, I think the answer is abundantly yes. And um, I'm glad I was just after your talk because you've set it up beautifully. Already, you should get a sense that the individuals uh, litigating, uh, going through this litigants, are, um, have very rich stories. And I will suggest to you that those are stories that can be told very much uh, in engagement with engagement with brain science. So are there brain stories? I think the answer is yes. We'll get into that. The second question, and perhaps the toughest, is 
Will anyone listen to those stories? Uh, there's good evidence already out there, and judges don't always listen to it. Is there any reason to think that this new evidence from brain science will move the dial at all? Again, given the system that you've just heard described. And here I think the answer has to be maybe. I don't know. Um, I think there is some reason to think maybe the answer is yes, uh, but also reason to be skeptical, and really our work in this next year will be to explore that. Um, but if the answer is to be yes, it surely will be dependent on how the story is told, how the evidence is presented, and we'll get into that. And then third, uh, and this is really looking ahead, I'll just say a few words at the end, what would a productive collaboration here look like? It can't just mean dropping a Journal of Neuroscience study into immigration court. Um, what, is it, what does it look like? And again, you know, there's much work already being done. Uh, how do you build on that uh, and expand uh, upon it? So let me talk about each of these questions. First, is there a brain story to tell? I use those words uh, because the lab that I run, the NeuroLaw Lab, our motto is every story is a brain story. I think that's very much true, that every single one of us and every one of the 700,000 individuals awaiting their hearing uh, to stay in this country have a brain story to tell. Um, but we can get more specific uh, in this context um, of, of immigration, deportation, asylum. So here are just a couple of snippets of research and findings from the past year, slightly more than a year uh, in, in a couple of them. Uh, there was a meta-analysis published this past year that looked at, and this was already mentioned, traumatic brain injury uh, uh, in um, asylum seekers. The bottom line, those injuries are, quote, common amongst refugee and asylum seekers, and these injuries are strongly linked to cognitive, emotional, and behavioral changes following the brain injury. And you think about the perilous journey that so many uh, individuals have taken, and then the experiences that they've had here, experiences where they do not have some of the access that uh, they would want and that we might want them to have to care. It's not hard to imagine um, the reality of those statistics. So there's one. Second, there are two reports that I just want to flag from this past year. One came from the government itself, September 2019, the Office of Refugee Resettlement. This is a part of um, the Department of Health and Human Services issued their report, sort of very generically and governmentally titled, Care Provider Facilities Described Challenges Addressing Mental Health Needs of Children in HHS Custody. The bottom line is that conditions suck. Here is what they said. Again, this is the government language, but I think my description is very apt. Facilities reported their challenges employing mental health clinicians resulted in high caseloads and limited their effectiveness in addressing children's needs. Facilities also reported challenges accessing external mental health providers and transferring children to facilities within the network that provide specialized treatment. Policy changes in 2018, picking up on a theme you've already heard, exacerbated these concerns as they resulted in longer stays in OR custody and a rapid increase in the number of younger children, many of whom had been separated from their parents after entering the United States. Uh, again, the medical, uh, I think, description is that sucks, um, but it really is problematic. And those brain stories are stories that are trending in the wrong direction when the proper interventions aren't there. So that's the government itself, based on hundreds and hundreds of interviews uh, with those in the mix of the program. A second report, which I commend to you if you're interested in the issue around uh, trauma at the border, was called Trauma at the Border, the Human Cost of Inhumane Immigration Policies. It's a 200 plus page report uh, from the US Commission on Civil Rights charged with doing these uh, things. I will give you just one of their bottom line conclusions. Quote, agencies continue not to provide appropriate and critical legal and medical services to two detainees, end quote. And there have been multiple other smaller scale reports, media coverage and the like, documenting the challenges that these individuals and in the framework that I'm suggesting, these brains are undergoing. Uh, I do wanna make one note and I'll come back to this in a second. Our program was titled Trauma at the Border and you know, so was that report. Um, but this trauma is being experienced by so many being detained across the country in other facilities. You've just heard talk about one where individuals are taken away often from their treatment and from access to treatment providers. One other note, just looking back at this past year, it is worth noting that a number of professional organizations and providers uh, have begun to try and raise their voice and fill this gap. Uh, just one, of course, Physicians for Human Rights has been at the forefront of this for decades. Uh, but in addition, the American Psychological Association has launched a new effort uh, 
has others. And I'll note again just on this second question of is there a problem? There absolutely is. Here's um, not a statistic, but a quote from one of the psychologists studying these family separation issues. Now, these were individuals not the border. Um, these were individuals who had come into the country looking at their subsequent uh, experience from Jessica Goodkind, um, uh, a sociologist at University of New Mexico, working with psychologists as well. We were surprised to find that family separation was on par with beating and torture in terms of its relationship to subsequent mental health. Quote, this tells us that family separation is one of the driving factors that creates psychological distress, end quote. I could go on and on. Um, I think you get the point. I want to add one more of these barriers to pick up exactly on what Sabi just said about uh, on the litigation context, the role that memory plays. Um, and there is this barrier uh, that inferences are drawn from inconsistent stories, the inference most likely being that because someone's story has changed, they are intentionally trying to deceive the court. Um, there is uh, buckets of memory science and neuroscience that would suggest otherwise. Uh, but that's often not heard. OK, so there's question one, and really the big one, which sets the problem. There are stories to be told, and those stories are very challenging. Question two, do you need neuroscience? Do you need any brain science here? It's a great question. It's a question that's been asked in other contexts. In the context of juvenile justice, do you need neuroscience to tell you that there's a difference between a 16-year-old and a 37-year-old? Do you need neuroscience um, uh, to tell you uh, that it's not a good thing to separate young kids from their parents. I don't think so. And so you might say from one view that all you really need is common sense and compassion. And I would agree with that. And yet we've found in these other areas that common sense and compassion have not gone very far. And so the three leading cases around juvenile justice and sentencing have cited to neuroscience. They've also cited all of these other reasons, but they've introduced neuroscience not as the only lever, but as an additional lever that may, for whatever reasons, go beyond the additional reasons that we may think things ought to change. And I think there's at least the possibility of that here, though I don't know, because it's very clear to me, hearing what I've just heard, that compassion and common sense are in short order. So I don't know if neuroscience uh, will help. But it seems to me it's worth a try, and that's what we're trying to do at the center. Uh, why might there be some neuro use of neuroscience here? I think it's primarily because it allows the court and others in the system to see the things that individuals are trying to talk about. And I want to, by way of parallel, give you a quote from my colleague, Teresa Harris, who's at the American Association for the Advancements of Science, AAAS. And they have a wonderful program around geospatial location and human rights. And here's her quote, and this is usually related in cases related to torture and uh, legal processes afterwards. Aerial photography and satellite images have long served human rights NGOs as important documentation tools. Since the earliest applications to document mass graves and refugee movements, human rights practitioners have become increasingly savvy about the way these technologies can help document and show changes and corroborate witness testimony. For the first time ever, we are able to haltingly, imperfectly, but at least somewhat look into the functioning of the human brain and to make that visual and to make real or more real what is already real but isn't believed to be real. Uh, and I think there's perhaps something to that. Now, the caveat is that, as I mentioned before, this is not uh, an effort, because we don't have the technology or the tools to do it, to scan individual brains and put that before the court. Rather, this is an effort to think globally about what do we know about the way brains change when they uh, experience this sort of trauma at a group level? And is there a way to combine that group level data with all the individual level assessment from physicians and others that might be more compelling for a court. That's at least the value proposition. So last two minutes on question three. Uh, I think, again, question one, there are stories to tell that are related to brain science. Question two, it seems to me there's at least the possibility, given what we've seen in other areas of law and given the context here, that neuroscience might have a role to play. Um, but what would that role look like? I just want to offer a couple of preliminary points and really emphasize that these are Preliminary. Since our program in March, um, I've talked with uh, a number of colleagues, both uh, on the law side, clinicians, and on the science side. 
What's become clear is that this is really an early conversation. I mean, it's not clear to anyone exactly how things should or could happen. Uh, but let me just throw out a couple of possibilities. So one is, uh, I think it's clear that some sort of uh, actionable neuroscience would be needed. Um, that is, taking the science from animal and non-human uh, animal models, human models, and really trying to figure out, given the rules and the you know, many regulations uh, that govern the law in this area, how, do they, how can they actually be used? How would a judge actually um, uh, appreciate and understand uh, this information? That's not an easy thing to do. It involves a lot of collaboration, but that's probably point number one. These are expert affidavits. These are briefs, the things that lawyers work with. A second is that it's also clear, and this is an even tougher road to climb, that there's got to be some integration and engagement with the training that those on the, sitting on the bench and in the sort of asylum officer's seat are getting. Um, see, uh, officers, um, asylum officers complete, this is just quoting from their training, a rigorous six-week training course. They've got a 675-page manual. Could that course also involve some of this uh, work? Now, in terms of looking back, looking forward, and this trend, again, you've seen, there's been a push from this administration to take some of those credible fear interviews out of even those trainees and put it into the hands of others who don't have as much training and perhaps would be more likely to find um, non-credible, and maybe the trend is going the wrong direction. But that's a second way. You integrate it into the training. So maybe get to the case law, maybe get to the training. Uh, and then third, <clears throat> I would just say that what's clearly needed and it really um, modifies and amplifies those first two points, is really careful collaboration. Those Supreme Court cases in juvenile justice and neuroscience didn't appear overnight. They were the result of multiple years of stakeholders and uh, those involved uh, in the issues as well, sitting together, coming together, trying to work through these difficult issues on the science side, on the law side. But just as there's been success in some of those other areas, uh, I think there could be some success here. Um, so I'll end with that uh, potentially optimistic note and invite your consideration and questions uh, both now and later. Thanks so much. So I'll uh, start with a question. And before we open it up to everybody else, um, Francis ended on a, a potentially positive note, and I want to throw it back to the other three panelists about um, all of you painted quite a bleak picture. Um, and I was wondering, in each of your specific fields, removal, detention and removal, as well as access to care locally, as well as the bigger picture, what do you see as potentially hopeful moves, uh, plausible strategies going forward. Um, In the silver cloud category. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I think I have been blown away by the vastness and commitment of the response. The public charge rules that I was mentioning, there were over 260,000 individual comments, um, which is an extraordinary amount. And overwhelmingly, they were in opposition. Um, and what's interesting is that um, there has been a deep involvement by professionals across, you know, this is a very, um, transdisciplinary enterprise. I think we are seeing, as you mentioned, you know, we're seeing physicians, social workers, nurses, lawyers, people who um, did not necessarily get active um, at learning to work together, working together, and um, really um, perhaps forging new alliances and new paths to understanding um, how we can um, make change and make change that's positive across for many communities, including the most marginalized. So on the better days, um, when the sun comes out and I see it's not out right now, <laughs> um, that's what I hold on to. 
But I think there's no doubt that if you're working in the intersection of health and immigration, that, you know, these are, it's December and uh, the sun sets early right now. I think one of the things for me um, that I would say I see as a positive or what's been encouraging for me over the course of this project that I've been working on and seeing the changes that have come over the last seven years is uh, through doing interviews with so many people on the ground at the uh, on the forefront of this issue, healthcare providers, people from a wide range of organizations who are really passionate about this issue around inclusion for immigrants and everyone in terms of healthcare. And I think for me, that's what's been the most positive thing to see, that people are really passionate about this issue. And also, where there are limits at the federal level, pushing the city of Boston, pushing uh, the state of Massachusetts in terms of a lot of laws around like the Safe Communities Act and the Family Mobility Act at the state level in terms of increasing access to driver's licenses and how that has an impact on healthcare. There's just been a lot of mobilization around these issues and whenever I go to the State House and see all of the people there for these hearings and speaking in support of improving things on the ground, that you know is a source of inspiration for me and makes me feel like it's really important to know that there are people who are pushing very passionately for these issues and are working very hard to improve the state of things um, here locally, even though federally it might not be <laughs> as positive at the current moment. I think I'll say two things. Um, one thing that gives me hope are individual case victories, like the one that we had this morning. I went in thinking there was no way we would win protection for the client that we won protection for um, and was pleasantly surprised. So that, I think, you know, incremental change at the low levels, um, I think, makes a difference. Uh, I also have been blown away by sort of the mobilization happening and, and the increasing collaboration between healthcare professionals and lawyers mobilizing to push back against these policies. So, um, you know, two years ago, it might have been difficult for me to find a doctor who would drive three hours to a detention center to do an evaluation that took three hours um, and come back and be willing to carve out a whole morning to be available to testify in immigration court. We took on this case in September. We were able to find a doctor, you know, within days who was willing to carve this much time out of his regular work um, to do this and to train um, a resident to go with him to do the same going forward. And so there's just been, um, you know, I think a tremendous amount of new collaboration that didn't exist before um, that, you know, is really positive and I think really strengthens the um, immigrants' rights advocacy community. And I think we'll continue um, regardless of, you know, what administration um, is in power. So. We open it up for questions. Yes. This is a question for Francis. Uh, Francis, I'm, I'm curious. Um, you know better than I do all of this research suggesting that when you show people brain scans, they start to really, really believe something is true as opposed to, you know, otherwise. And I'm curious if you have any concerns about a world where the more involvement of neuroscience we see in trying to document and make the case for the problematic aspects of immigration, that those who cannot evince that kind of evidence end up running into problems going forward. Yeah, great question. So um, there is some evidence, uh, as Professor Cohen um, cites to that, although it's mixed, but, but some evidence suggesting that um, the presence of a brain scan, it, it calls multiple contexts, is persuasive in ways that maybe it shouldn't be. I do think there's a question about inequity here. Anytime you have a new set of tools, um, even if, if they're effective, we don't know if they are, but if they were, one would be concerned about the question of access. I think that's a question right now. Um, I've had this conversation with colleagues um, at the Binger Center for New Americans at the University of Minnesota where I work, and they have tremendous resources. I mean, kind of like the, the clinics do here, but, um, but many others don't. I thought you might go in a different direction with that question. Um, there's also a double-edged sword and dark side of using these sorts of technologies. And I think the best example is some of the proposed DNA testing that's um, being piloted at the border. And I was thinking about it in the context I hadn't thought about it until your great presentation about um, the ways in which one might, 
and apparently using your logic, say, we're going to screen everyone, and this goes to the rest of the Petri Flom group here where you guys work on this. We're going to use uh, the fancy genetic uh, analysis to determine who is likely to become a burden on society, who is more likely to develop Alzheimer's, and we're going to use that as evidence to say, eh, we don't want you because you're okay now, but we anticipate that you're going to be a major drag on resources based on your genetic profile. We could actually do that now um, from a scientific perspective, and given the current political climate, it doesn't seem that we're all that far away. Um, so I do think there's a dark side to technology that's got to be considered. Uh, Savvy, one more question. You you suggested that the um, the grant rates were largely due to how many lawyers uh, are there, but do you also, well, first you see an evolution over time, and second of all, might it also be the judges and the courts and the general social context and what kinds of attributions? So there are vast disparities in grant rates depending on the court that you're in, and even within a court, which judge you're in. And there's a great resource, if anyone's curious about this track, it's run out of Syracuse that um, tracks, <coughs> no pun intended, uh, each judge within any particular court um, and what their particular grant rate is. Um, but the um, Executive Office for Immigration Review, which is the office of the Department of Justice that the immigration courts fall under, also tracks this. And um, you know, if you look at the statistics, depending on where you are, so Georgia or Arizona, for example, um, that those courts have, on average, you know, a single digit grant rate, potentially, whereas courts in the Northeast or San Francisco have, you know, 50, 60, 70 percent. So of how many people get? Yeah, so I mean, if it's 80 percent in Massachusetts versus 8 percent in Georgia, out of what? Out of the total number of people whose cases right, are decided, and that. What kind, what what kind of numbers? So the asylum office, I think, I was looking at the statistics last night. I think maybe around twenty thousand people got a th got asylum um, as of the last asylum office update about that. I think around the same number in immigration courts across the country. So the absolute numbers of people who are getting protection to stay here are quite low out of the 700,000 cases that are pending, um, in part because very few cases are actually decided in any given year because of the backlog, the million plus case backlog. Um, but the actual absolute numbers are pretty low. And I guess I would just piggyback on Glenn's question to Francis and say, you know, I think in the clinic we're, we always, we often think about the fact that we submit a thousand pages right in support of a client who we had this morning and the judge says oh i always know when it's a harvard clinic case cuz i've got to read these thousands of pages um, and and we think about the potentially negative effects of that right on people who are pro se who don't have lawyers and and what that might mean for them and our hope is that perhaps in reading the kinds of expert affidavits that we submit that explain things like the effects of traumatic brain injury on memory, trauma on memory, um, country condition expertise on you know, conditions in a particular place, that perhaps that knowledge gained will inform adjudication of other cases even where we're not submitting that same evidence, that the more adjudicators read this information, sort of the the more attuned to it they are, whether or not it's being presented in a given case. But that's our optimistic. Yeah, I, and I mean, and Physicians for Human Rights has, um, which is one of the major national suppliers and, and trainers, they have some great statistics about how um, the inclusion of one of their physicians is um, significantly positive for outcomes. And, you know, there's some way in which that will change that and also then generate maybe more physicians who are willing to come spend time and, and work with you. Could you comment on domestic violence and gang violence as uh, reasons for getting asylum, which clearly have implications for people's health and for their threats at being returned to their countries? <laughs> 
Yeah, so former Attorney General Sessions attempted to proclaim um, that people who flee gang violence and domestic violence aren't eligible for asylum in the U.S., but the, you know, what he, he, he issued a decision, matter of AB, and in that decision in dicta made lots of comments to that effect. That is as lawyers say, dicta, and so it is not binding on adjudicators. Um, and um, the holding of that decision was, in fact, quite narrow. All it said was that adjudicators have to, on a case-by-case -case basis, evaluate whether or not somebody would be eligible for protection, which has always been the case. Um, nothing new has happened around that. Um, and so, you know, we are still seeing, despite these proclamations and the negative rhetoric around people fleeing domestic violence and gang-based violence is ineligible for asylum. Um, many adjudicators across the country are continuing to do what they did before this administration proclaimed these things, um, which is grant cases for people who are fleeing domestic violence and gang-based violence. And the bulk of the cases that our clinic works on are, in fact, people who are fleeing um, those forms of violence. And we are more often than not successful in, in winning them protection. Please join me in thanking this great panel.